Joining me now, Sabrina Singh, Deputy Press Secretary for the Department of Defense. Sabrina, welcome to The Sunday Show. Thank you for having me this morning. So what kind of security guarantees could be offered to Ukraine? Could the, U could the U.S. security cooperation with Israel serve as a template? Well, look, I'm not going to get ahead of any decisions that the president or other partners and allies are going to make. But what we can say is that throughout this war, since the beginning of this war, the United States has committed over $40 billion in security assistance for Ukraine. And they are using the security assistance, not just from us, from but from partners and allies valiantly on the battlefield. And as they uh, continue to commence on this counteroffensive, they are employing uh, the capabilities and systems that we have been providing them um, to great effect. And you've seen that from the beginning of the war with the Battle of Kiev and the Battle of Kharkiv to all the way now to the counteroffensive. So we're going to continue to support Ukraine for as long as it takes, and that's what the president has said all along. I'm going to uh, ask you about the counteroffensive in a moment, but in terms of systems um, that the United States is providing them, let's talk about the cluster, the, uh, yeah. the cluster bomb decision. Here's what the president had to say uh, about that. Watch. But it was not an easy decision, and it's not, we're not signatory to that, that agreement, but I, um, it took me a while to be convinced to do it. But the main thing is they either have the weapon to stop the Russians now from their, keep them from stopping the Ukrainian offensive through these areas, or uh, they don't, and I think they needed them. And so, Sabrina, perhaps the president's initial hesitation was because of the, the failure rate or dud rate of cluster bombs. The Washington Post reports that the Pentagon has assessed that the cluster munitions that, are, that will be sent to Ukraine have a dud rate, no, quote, no higher than 2.35%. When and how was that assessment done? Well, the assessment that we did was um, over the course of uh, many different trial tests, and the most recent one was in 2020. But as you just saw the president say, this was a hard decision to make. Uh, we've been providing unitary 155 millimeter rounds uh, to the Ukrainians, and they are continuing to um, use this artillery in uh, very high consum consumption rates. And so while this was a tough decision that the president and the secretary and, and our, um, you know, with Congress that we had to make. Um, this was a necessary decision to, in order to bridge the gap that we need, that we know that we need to continue to provide 155 millimeter rounds to the Ukrainians. And so we are confident in our testing and the dud rates, the, the low failure rates that these have. But it's important to remember that the Russians have been using cluster munitions in this fight with dead rates at over 30 to 40 percent. So we know that when this war ends, there's going to have to be a demining de process that's going to have to take place. Um, but we are confident in the assurances that the Ukrainians have given us that they will not be using these on, in urban or civilian populated mm -hmm. areas and that they will just be using these in, in the battlefield. Well, speaking of, uh, speaking of Congress, because you mentioned Congress uh, being notified about this decision, the statutory limit set by mm -hmm. Congress um, in terms of dud rate, is 1 percent. So how is the president getting around that statutory limitation? Well, again, we are we have been working and informing Congress with what we are providing the Ukrainians. We are confident in what we are providing, that the dud rates for these cluster munitions are 2.35 percent or lower. And so the president has the presidential authority to authorize this transfer to Ukraine, and we're confident that they will use them uh, responsibly on the battlefield. Um, there are many reports that the Ukraine counteroffensive isn't going well. Does the Pentagon share that view and what isn't going well? Well, look, this is a tough fight. This is a war. Um, we've seen the Ukrainians make incredible gains from the beginning of the war, pushing the Russians all the way to the east um, in the Bakhmut area. Um, we saw during the winter that the Russians laid uh, uh, mines and, and dragon's teeth throughout the east um, and really dug in during the winter um, while the Ukrainians were bolstering up their defenses and also going through training. We trained um, uh, some of our the Ukrainian troops out, out in Grafenvir in Germany. And so as the Russians dug in, uh, we know this is going to be a tough fight. And coming off of winter, the Ukrainians are going to do whatever it takes to continue with the counteroffensive. And, and the president has said, we're going to be with Ukraine for as long as it takes. But this is a tough fight, and we, we, they, they, we'll let the Ukrainians speak more to their operations for themselves. So N NBC News has exclusive yeah. reporting that reveals former U.S. officials have been holding secret talks with uh, Russians believed to be close to the Kremlin with the, quote, aim of laying the groundwork for negotiation to end the war in Ukraine. A according to, to sources, among those involved in these back-channel conversations are former Pentagon officials, including Mary Beth Long, a former assistant defense secretary, 
with deep experience in NATO issues. Is Secretary Austin aware of these back-channel conversations? Look, the secretary is focused on uh, making sure that Ukraine has what it takes to be successful in this in 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 this counteroffensive. Um, what you're seeing there with private citizens engaging with with Russian officials, I'll just leave it at that. Um, the secretary, we we remain uh, and our our lines remain open to communications from the Russians. Uh, we have not. Have any had had any engagement with them, um, but we certainly welcome any engagement with them. But right now, our our priority is focusing on what Ukraine needs in this fight. Well, I mean, would Secretary Austin view these back channel efforts as helpful? I, again, these are not uh, conversations that the secretary is part of, so I'll just let them stand for themselves. Okay. Um, and then there's Senator Tommy Tuberville, yeah. uh, Tuberville of uh, Republican of Alabama. He's been holding up more than 200 general and flag officer nominations over the Defense Department's new policy, uh, abortion policy that provides t paid time off and, and reimbursement of travel costs for service members who travel uh, to get reproductive health care, to, to get an abortion. What's the impact of Tuberville's um, Tuberville's uh, action or inaction on these promotions. Well, just to just to um, clarify a bit, the, yeah. the department has not changed its reproductive health policy. Um, we only cover what are called covered abortions. Um, what I will say is, when Roe was overturned, states took it upon themselves to limit or restrict reproductive health access. So, to allow for equity across all of our service members in different states and all over the world, of course, we would allow them to to go to another state that uh, offers these reproductive health services. Now, in terms of Senator Tuberville, tomorrow we uh, unfortunately will not be having a change of command ceremony for the Commandant of the Marine Corps. We will be having a relinquishment of responsibility um, instead. And that is because Senator Tuberville, like you said, has placed a hold on all of our general and flag officers. These are folks that are nonpartisan, um, nonpolitical uh, general and flag officers who lead our military in in a time when we are facing the most acute threat of Russia, when we're facing the pacing challenge of China that we know that we have to keep up with, and yet he's put an arbitrary hold on, on our um, general and flag officers because he doesn't seem to understand our policy. And um, this is going to have real-world impacts. And so tomorrow, with the relinquishment of uh, responsibility, we have not had an acting commandant in over a century. So this is going to have a huge impact, not just on the Marine Corps, but um, later this week, Sec uh, General Brown will be testifying um, as he is the next nominated uh, uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Um, and these are going to have huge impacts that are going to have ripple and cascading effects all through the services. You're going to have people that are doing dual-headed jobs in and, and a time when, you know, we're facing one of the greatest security threats in Europe. Um, speaking of the commandant of the Marine of the yeah. Marine Corps, since it's a relinquishment of, of responsibilities, yeah. will this <clears throat> acting person have limited uh, limited authority? Will that person not be able to fully exercise the powers of the commandant of the Marine Corps because that person is not the commandant of the Marine Corps? Well, he'll be able to um, still lead and, and guide the, the Marine Corps through um, whatever ch wh whatever it, it needs. Um, but you have to think this is a person in an acting responsibility that's also going to have a dual-hatted role with his previous position. Uh -huh. So it is someone that, um, if you're doing two jobs at once, you're never going to be a, um, in, in the right state uh, to fully execute on your responsibilities. You want to make sure that you have a Senate-confirmed leader in that position. And, and real fast, yeah. you mentioned the, the new... The the uh, nominated new chairman of the Joint Chiefs of yeah. Staff, does Tuberville, Tuberville's hold on promotions impact him? Absolutely. Uh, Senator Tuberville is the one um, that is holding up all of these holds. Got it. Um, and so that directly impacts the chairman. And at a time, again, when we have the, the threat of Russia, the rising threat of China, um, to not to, for the president not to have a Senate-confirmed um, general officer giving his best military advice is incredibly damaging. Deputy Pentagon Press Secretary Sabrina Singh, thank you very much for coming to The Sunday Show. Thank you so much for having me.